Today's episode is brought to you by West End, South Australia's most iconic beer. Now, it's a clean, fresh draft beer. There's nothing more local, nothing more South Australian than cracking a red tin. It's hard to explain what it means when someone is able to be that vulnerable in front of such a big group of people. We spend every day together, but you, you, don't, you just don't have those conversations mm. when you're in the locker room or before games or, or any time really. So yeah, for us to have those moments where people are able to open up and we can learn about them more as a person, I think it, it, able, it enables us to become closer as friends and, and as a brotherhood. We're pretty much family. We spend every single day together. So. I think our group has been really good, especially at being being really open and um, we've had some people drive that at the football club over the last couple of years. So I think it's a really important part of um, our culture as a whole. Connor Rosie and Zach Butters are two young men going places fast. Now the 22 year olds have each had four years in the AFL system and are key pillars of Port Adelaide Football Club's future. Connor Rosie, well, he's a class act and he's had a huge 2022, named all Australian and he claimed the Power's Best and Fairest Award. Well, Zach Butters plays with a ferocity and intensity rarely seen. He's the sort of guy who would break through brick walls for his teammates. These boys are as important to the Port Adelaide Footy Club off-field as they are on it, driving a strong culture through sharing their stories and embracing their vulnerabilities. Rightio, let's go. Welcome along to The Soda Room, a place where we get to know the real stories behind some of the biggest names in the game. It was like we had won the grand final. I just got some new boots. It was something yeah. special for me. Did you understand the significance of that moment? Oh, yeah. Nothing compared. That's what I thought I had to do as a leader. you got the same undies on. <laughs> I've got exactly the same ones on. Zach Butters, Connor Rosie, thanks for joining us, guys. It's an honour, mate. I'd like to call you boys the future of the Port Adelaide Football Club. Can I do that? <laughs> I'll that. Uh, yeah, I'll that. Uh, <laughs> just to kick things off, too, I think, um, Zach, we do have to acknowledge that your partner in crime here, Connor, is now the reigning Jack Kale medalist from this week. Congratulations, mate. Thanks, Soda. Best and fairest winner at 22. Did you expect it? You were the favourite. So do you go in there going, oh, look, I reckon I'm a good chance, but you don't want to admit it? Come yeah, on. Yeah, best and fairest is a bit funny because... I guess in previous years, even since I've been at the club, I remember Bokey was second in the Brownlow one year and didn't even win our best and fairest. Mm. So, um, yeah, it's it's kind of hard to tell. It depends on how the coaches view you and they look at a lot of different things compared to what the umpires or other people from the outside look at. So I'm going to make this easy now. Rather than you tell us about how good your year was, Zach, you witnessed it all. Tell us about Connor's year and tell us about Connor as a player. Yeah, he, was, he had a crazy year, I think. Most people will say this if you ask me, like when he come in the midfield halfway th- through the round five against Carlton mm. and pretty much nearly got us back in the, I think we ended up losing by three points and yep. we were down by seven or eight goals at one stage. And then mm. from there, you just kept building every game. I think you, th- you kept going on level, another level, you know, Anzac Day medal, showdown medal. Yeah. So he was just, yeah. All kept, Australian. Yeah, all Australian and top five in the um, AFLPA award as well. So I think... Yeah, he kept growing and then, yeah, it's, it's pretty exciting to watch as a teammate and playing out there with him, just um, watching him go to work. And, yeah, I think he's just so dynamic and powerful and, and then he's got the footy IQ to match with that. And then, yeah, he's seen games where, yeah, he was going forward as well and kicking three or four goals. And, yeah, um, yeah I think he just had a real good rounded year. And I think once he once they gave him that opportunity in the midfield in round five, he just grew in confidence off that. And then, yeah, then he was pretty much unstoppable from there. <laughs> we'll get back to that in a moment. Right, let's return the favour now. Um, Connor, tell us about Zach as a player because I've got to say from someone watching, <clears throat> Zach, you play like an absolute maniac and there's like, <laughs> honestly, when you watch it, I reckon there's this intensity in your eyes and your face that I get really excited watching <laughs> when we watch your game. What's it like standing next to him on the ground, Connor? Yeah, it's a great point and he brings that intensity not only in games but in training. Um, the coaches often have to tell him to – slow down a couple of steps because he's cracking people that hard. So, I mean, that's the type of person you want to be a teammate with, someone that you love playing with and people mm. hate playing against. Not only has he got that, but he's probably one of the hardest workers that we've got at the club. So I think he's been great for our whole young group, um, setting the standard. I know that I'm always trying to keep up with him in running. So it's always just pushing everyone else along with him. And I mm. think that's the biggest difference that he's made at our footy club so far. But He's come such a long way off the field as well with his maturity and I'm sure he'll be a leader of our football club at some point. 
Tell us something about Zach that we might not know besides the fact I think you put tomato sauce on bloody everything, don't you? <laughs> Seriously, you yeah. need to work on your taste buds. But yeah. <laughs> something about Zach that people might know. He's a bit of a clean freak, surprisingly. So I know he's had a couple of boys live with him and he's given him the stern word um, during the <laughs> week to tidy up their act. So um, he's got Francis Evans moving in with him after Christmas. So I'll be really interested to see how that goes. So has Francis had the orientation yet? Does he know what he's in for? Or are you just you're going to give it to him full barrel when he gets there? Nah, Frankie seems pretty good. I think he lived in Geelong with a few of the young boys as well. So I think he's had a bit of experience. And yeah, Frankie actually seems, he seems like a ripper so far. And um, yeah, he's been impressive on the track as well. Well, Zach, tell us about Connor. Obviously now he's become, let's be honest, he's like the poster child now of the Port Adelaide <laughs> Football Club really, isn't he? Now that he's won the, the Jack Cale as well as everything else he's doing. Something about him that we might not know. Um, he's gone full reno mode, just got a new house. Um, so yeah, all off season, it was pretty hard to get a hold of. Um, other than the two weeks we had him in America, he reckons he was, yeah, ringing tradies and organizing, <laughs> organizing deals and getting on the tools and then spoke to his old man at the BNF and old, old mate Rob just reckons he's just popping in and out just as he <laughs> please and Rob was stuck there doing all the work. So I don't know how much work Rose actually has done on the house yet, but yeah, he's, he reckons he's gone full block mode. What are you doing at the place? Yeah, bought an old character home, so pretty much stripped the joint. Um, just starting to add back things at right. the moment, and yeah, like you said, dad, dad's been huge. He's recently semi-retired, so he's got a bit of time on his hands, and yeah, I've put him to good use. <laughs> so he's your foreman, <laughs> essentially. Have you got any idea what you're doing? You're sort of learning on the job. A little bit, yeah. And so is dad, to be honest. He's he's a bit of a handyman, so he's mm. a groundsman um, at a few different schools. So. He's one of those people that just sort of knows how to fix random things yeah. that you would never really yeah. learn, and he's learning a lot of things on the job, and he's tried to teach me a few things, but I'm not <laughs> I'm not that great at that sort of stuff, so I'm better at giving the instructions rather than taking them. So you've got a good project at the moment you're working on. Yeah, it's been yeah. really good, actually, just to take my mind off of things. Even now, like coming home and, and planning with architects and that sort of mm. thing, is, I find it really interesting. So it's nice to have something away from football and even away from the boys of the club that um, I can put a bit of focus into and, and takes up some of my spare time. Are we going to see anything personalised in it? So is there a pool with like a big number 20 on the bottom <laughs> or have we got like a big CR on one of the walls or something? Is no. there anything with a bit of personal touch to it? I don't think uh, the missus would allow that, unfortunately, <laughs> but I'm going to try and sneak something in. I think you need a nice cabinet for a few medals and trophies along the way. Hopefully... Maybe a premiership cup in there at some point. That would be nice, wouldn't it? Now, in the old days, end of season trip was get on the source, go and have some fun, travel <laughs> the world. But now you two boys have gone away with Trav Boak, who's, let's say, what, the most professional footballer on the planet. Connor, what is going away with Travis Boak like? Yeah, I wouldn't say we we miss out on that. Oh, you still have some fun? part of it, yeah. Oh, we good, probably good. have a couple of weeks to, to let the hair down, which is always yeah. nice, best part of the year. But yeah, I guess... Travis came to us and, and with our gym people thought it was just a good opportunity. Mm. He's been doing it for a few years now, so um, a good opportunity before he retires, I guess, for us to learn what he's been doing. It's quite a bit different to the normal training that we'd normally do at the club. So, yeah, it was a really interesting experience going to America and something that I'll probably um, end up going back and, and learning a little bit more. So what are you doing there? Because obviously Boki in his last four or five years has been amazing. Yeah, I think it's more around your own individual body, which is probably hard to get when you're at a footy club with 45 blokes and three or four gym instructors. So it's hard to get that one-on-one -on -one time to really focus on your own body and yep. what you actually need to, you know, get rid of them niggles or focus on some strengths as well. So, yeah, Austin over there um, was really good in that and he yeah, looks at your body and um, you can give him some things that you want to work on as well. Mm to help your game and then just go to work on them for a few weeks. And um, for me, it was some shoulder stuff and some ankle stuff and had some issues with them in the past. So it was good to just, yeah, learn learn about them more and then mm. him give me some exercises and really challenge me in that area to try and get it better. And, um, yeah, hopefully that helps with performances on the field and staying healthy for longer. Just good to mix it up and try some new things. I feel like you can't really go wrong trying new things. They can probably only help and then – if they don't work, they don't work, but at least you've sort of gave it a crack and mm. figured it out. You might only take one or two things out of it to add into your program or yeah. to add into your routine, but I think that's what the point is, to just try and get some new things involved and um, see what works for you. And Cotton, what about for you? What was the main sort of aim or goal that you worked on there? It's pretty difficult in a team environment when you've got to take time away from the gym people who we've only got 
like Zach said, two or three in there at a time to try and really get individualized programs. So yep. yeah, for me, it was my shoulder again as well. I was having a few issues during the year. So a few things to put in my warm up um, before training or before games, just mm. to get my shoulder going a little bit more. But those things make a massive difference just to not have that on your mind when you're going into a contest or, or at training. Yep. So yeah, the little things add up and, and hopefully get rid of most of my niggles before the season starts. So is it, Body preparation stuff, or is there mindset stuff you're doing as well? Is there aerobic stuff? I would say it's mostly, mostly exercises that aren't, aren't the normal, you know, deadlift, bench press, which we'd normally do yeah. um, at the club. It's, curls? Are there any curls done no. anymore? You just know, <laughs> no curls. So we barely lifted any weights to be yeah. completely honest. There was a lot of rock climbing. Yeah, a lot of body movements that you wouldn't normally do. That probably don't look that hard when you're just looking at it, but because you haven't done them normally you're using different muscles and yeah, I guess that's the point of it to just try something different. We were over there for 12, 10 days. We probably had gym eight or nine of them days, four or five running sessions and a few field sessions. We lost them working on speed and mm. technique and that. So I think um, especially in when you're doing individual sessions that when you're in there for an hour and a half, just you and him, I think it's more mentally draining, trying to learn new exercises and push your body mm. into positions that probably hasn't been in often. So I think, yeah, we're getting home and we're all looking at each other like, gee, I'm knackered. Like I could fall asleep right now. So as much as it was physically challenging, I think mentally as well, just trying all these new things and trying to get your brain around learning them new ways to go about it was just as challenging. And you boys mentioned this guy, Austin. Who's Austin? Is, is he the guru? Yeah, he's the guru. Yeah, he's, he's the man that runs it all. And yeah, he's worked with a lot of high profile athletes overseas as well. Yep. Um, and then, yeah, obviously Boki and then a few other AFL players were starting to head over there as well when we were leaving and um, beforehand. And now I saw Mitch Georgiades popped up as well. How, how many other boys did you have over there? We had, yeah, Mitch, Connor, myself, um, Ryan Burton and Boki. So, yeah, we had a big, nice house in Santa Cruz that we just shared and, um, yeah, all that own. We had a pool table and a spa as well. So right. off-field was pretty enjoyable as well going back there. And, yeah, we, we smashed the pool table for t 12 days straight basically. <laughs> Who was the best? I still were pretty much king of the table. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I think I had Mitch 10-2 individually, so. Jeez. He wouldn't uh, admit that. Yeah, though. he won't admit that, though. So you're the man, Zach. <laughs> oh, I, Mitch is probably the easiest one to beat, so I was just going to town on him. <laughs> okay. Boys, I, I want to go back to the start for you because you've now had four seasons. You're both 22 years of age, and obviously you, you came in and with Xavier Dersmer as well. I thought what was remarkable was quite often, you know, you get, you get one good young player come in and really make their mark. Occasionally you get two, but you're just bloody rare to get three. And I know the three of you guys were high draft picks. That first year, tell us from your point of view, Zach, you obviously played the first game all together. As you are in that year, did you start to realise that there's something special amongst you guys and your group and, and now as Mitch Georgiades and there's so many others coming into it? Yeah, it was definitely an exciting season. Yeah, playing pretty much almost every game together. And yeah, I still remember uh, talking to Rose in the preseason that year saying, imagine how good it would be to be play round one. And yeah get a game and then, yeah, look back at the end of the year. We all played pretty much the whole season. So, yeah, it was definitely an exciting season and learned a lot from it. Yeah, there wasn't yeah too much pressure on us then or um, we were just pretty much going out there and playing footy. And um, I think, yeah, I look back and, yeah, it was, it was one of the funnest years I've had just debuting and learning so much as well. And, yeah, it's exciting to have a few boys my age going through the mm. exact same thing and at the exact same time. So, oh, so you obviously picked 12. You were pick five, Connor. And then obviously Xavier wasn't far behind. I can remember that first game because you played the D's at the MCG and you got a nice win by 20 odd points, I think. Which one of you two was getting into Max Gorn's face? Was that you, Connor, on Debut? One of you was just ripping into him, walking off the ground, wasn't Yeah, it? it was a couple of us, I think. Yeah, we probably thought we were a bit better than we were. That's yeah. <laughs> I can remember watching the game and I'm going, how good is this? Because you see these blokes, you guys with a bit of spunk, you're having a crack at you know, one of the best players in the league. But it didn't look arrogant. It looked confident. Tell us about that. Yeah, I can remember before the game, Kenny put a bit of a target on Maxie's head and said um, that if we were going to win the game, we we're going to have to get into him a little bit. And I guess we probably <laughs> took that a little bit, yeah. literally, and <laughs> yeah. at halftime thought, you know, we'll have a crack. Uh, I remember we, Kenny just saying that we weren't exempt. Like, it was a te whole team job and that just because of our first game or, yeah, it's your first game, but it's not about you today. It's sort of like there's, we're trying to win. Um and this helps us win. And then, 
yeah, I, I think obviously we were up during most of the game and, um, yeah, we had our tails up and I think that definitely probably helped a bit and um, Gorney's probably got us back a few times since then. <laughs> I think so many people watching were probably excited because, you, you know, you think certainly your first even year or two that you go about your business, but you guys were up front. Is that what we expect now? But, you know, you see young people come in with this confidence and I know you both played good senior footy before you got into playing at this level. Did that equip you to walk in and go up to, you know, well-known star players and go, right, I'm here, I'm new, I'm going to have a crack at you? Yeah, I think I think you probably see that a little bit more often with the kids coming through, um, that sort of confidence and swagger, even in different sports. The younger generation seems to have a mm. bit of, of that extra <laughs> ego and it's probably a good thing to some extent. Um, yeah. Is it because you watch a lot of American sport? Yeah, probably. <laughs> yeah. It actually is a good yeah. point, yeah. yeah. NBA is um, huge, even NFL, like, and I think over there they're not afraid to be whoever they want yep. to be compared to probably Australian mm. sport, how it is now. Mm. But, yeah, it's good to see some kids come through with some confidence mm. and, yeah, back themselves in because, um, yeah, it's a tough game and if you don't have confidence in yourself, it's pretty hard for other people to have confidence in you. So is that you played in the flag at Dali, right, country Victoria, the back as Marshway, and, um, Connor, as we know, you played in the flag for North Adelaide in 2018. So because you both have played against men at, you know, good levels, when you got to AFL footy, was the jump as high, I'll ask you, Zach, was it as high as you expected? I think in terms of training and all the running, I think in that that terms of sense, that I was like, okay, that's that's pretty hard. The <clears> sessions, <throat> you know, not aren't twice a week and for an hour where you just sort of tick the legs over. Yeah. Like that sort of, the training side and the professionalism side probably shocked me more than the actual games and um, the yeah. footy side of things. And, yeah, I, I think, yeah, playing senior footy at Dali and um, with some good figures like Heath Scotland and mm. um, some other profiled players that have been in some big games before and yeah, they didn't hold back on me so I always just thought I wasn't going to hold back on them back then and just tried to keep that mentality the whole way through. Yeah. And for you, Connor, I mean, you obviously played in that flag for North against some quality players and I'll tell you what, how good was your North team because how many of those blokes are now playing AFL footy? Yeah, that's a good point. Did you walk into AFL level going, I'm ready? And uh, like you kicked five goals in your third game, I think, didn't you? So did you feel ready to make an impact? Short answer is no. Uh, I guess you always know there's a massive step, like even coming from under 18s to league footy, mm. there's always a big step and then there's a big step again. But I think our games especially probably suit AFL almost better than they do Sample. Um, Sample's quite a contested inside ball winning. You see a lot of stocky midfielders running around. So I actually found Sample quite difficult. And yeah, I guess coming into AFL, my game probably suits the overall game style mm. a little bit and more a bit open. I, I guess I wasn't, Sure that I was ready for it, but after a full preseason and, and Kenny backing us, I, I guess that really helped us moving forward. And I know on the eve of the finals, <clears throat> after you'd come back from your under-18 championships, you played a few games and Jacob Surgeon and Josh Carr were involved with the coaching there and they considered dropping you, didn't they, for the finals? And then I think Serge said, well, put him on a back flank, we'll teach you to attack. And Serge reckons that's the reason why you went number five, not further in the draft, because he really got you into that for that final series. But I can remember watching you in that final series thinking, as a teenager, you looked as comfortable as any senior player out there, but it didn't feel like that, did it? Like you said, I played forward that whole year, so um, it was a bit of a shell shock to have Curry come up to me and say, you're going to be playing halfback for the first final. But I think once you take a few grabs and the boys back in a little bit, then you gain a bit of confidence and I feel like... As a player in general, I've probably grown a lot to be able to perform better in those moments um, and stand up when the pressure gets a bit bit more. So, yeah, it probably did me good in the end that that they, yeah, I guess challenged me to mm. change my game a bit in, in, in the big moments. Tell me about mindset because, you know, you go in there with that confidence and you, you ruffle up the demons in your first game and everything goes along really, really nicely. Zach, so how do you prepare yourself? How do, to give people an understanding for someone who is elite like you guys now, what's your thought process and your mindset going into a game? Yeah, it basically starts since the last game finished for me, like just making sure that I go through my process for the next week and that I get to tick every box, whether it's recovery, training, doing the extras, don't watch my vision from the week before. Mm. So I think as well, like, you can reflect and dwell on a game as a bad game, but it's about getting back in and making sure when I get to the game, I can look back on my week and think like, yep, I've ticked all the boxes. I've done everything to perform. And then you can sort of go out there on the weekend and then you can leave that all behind you and think, mm. 
give my best chance to perform so I can just go out there and have fun and um, play footy and, and do what you do. I think that's when I play my best footy when I'm not going out there trying to impress anyone, trying to think I need to prove the coach is wrong, I need to do this, like just going out there and just picturing like I'm back home at Dali having fun and playing footy and just making sure I, I show up, um, like be competitive and that's my number one thing, just be competitive every week and I just think I'll let my footy do the rest of the talking. So that's that's what I do. Do you have doubts? Do you ever doubt your ability? Oh, I think every athlete has doubts, but I think it's how you handle them and how you can overcome them to get back to a good mindset and where you want to be and mm. where you know you need to be to perform. So I think, yeah, I think any athlete that they have, don't have, haven't had a doubt or don't doubt themselves for a second would be lying. So I think you definitely have that in the journey, but I think there's more positives that outweigh yep. that doubt that yep. get you back in that good state that, yeah, get you having fun and performing. Corner, what about you? Do you ever line up against someone going, oh, this bloke might have my measure? Or are you at the point now where you guys are so focused and confident in your process, in your belief that you don't have the doubt? Yeah, I think that's probably the biggest thing that I've grown with um, over my first four years of football. It's hard coming in as a young player. You play a bad game and all of a sudden you think you're the worst player mm. on the team. You're going to get dropped. Um, I'm not going to play footy again. But I think if you build that that base over a long period of time, um, the good players learn that if they have a bad game or a bad moment, that they can they can bounce back from that because they know that they've built the base over a long period of time. Mm. So that's probably the biggest thing out of everything that I've learned over the first few years is I'm, I'm a pretty big confidence player. So if I made a mistake in the past, I'd probably probably dwell on it for a while and yep. and that sort of thing. So um, I think now now that I'm, a, I'm able, able to move past that more quickly and even game to game, yeah, lining up on anyone, I feel like, can be a nerve-wracking experience. But you know if you've done the work that you're prepared and, yeah, it'll take you. Good enough. You know That's you're good it. enough against anyone? Yeah, it's a good point. You mentioned the other night when you, you won the best and fairest that you were a little nervous about perhaps getting dropped after, I think, four rounds. You'd been averaging 12 touches and only kicked a couple of goals. That game that uh, Zach talked about at halftime against Carlton, you're 49 points down. You go into the midfield and have a cracking game. Did you honestly think you were going to get dropped? Yeah, as much as the coaches say, they're probably not thinking about you. You, you genuinely yeah, I, did. I 100% thought it in the back of my mind. And yeah, that, that game, I guess we were struggling and I was probably struggling in the first half. So Kenny came up to me at halftime and just said, release the expectations and and the pressure on yourself and just play footy. Don't worry about standing in a specific spot at, mm. at with our structures and that sort of thing. Just play your natural game. And that's probably when I play my best football. So Geez, that's not a bad instruction, is it? Forget the structures, just go out there and do what you want to do. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I guess it helps when you're getting beat by fifty points mm. because nothing else has been working. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, that was really, really big for me in my whole career. Tell us about Kenny. What's he been like for you, Zach? Give us an insight into Kenny, the man, away from what we all see. Yeah, I have a good relationship with Kenny personally, on field and off field, and yeah, he he probably like Rose said, takes a lot of expectation off me as a player and just mm. often just tells me, just don't think about it too much. Just go there and do your thing. Like you really think about enough and like what, what you thinking about is plenty. So just go out there and play footy. And as long as you're playing for the team and playing your role, like the rest will take care of itself. So he's really good in that sense of just um, letting me be me out there. And so, like, yeah, Bass as well does it really well. Mm. And says like, it's like you're sort of an artist. You're showing off your own piece, like your own character. Like that's what footy's about in a way. Like you, you're going out there and showing off who you are and what part of the team you are as well. So, and then off field, yeah, Kenny's a bit like a father figure. He's just always up for a chat. Mm. Um, he's got, got a good sense of humour um, sometimes. I don't give him too much there. Just on that, now is this a true story? I thought one of the boys was saying once that when Bryn Teekle came into the club, he introduced him to the boys as Tess. <laughs> is that true? Yeah, that's yeah. true. He's yeah. still trying to go with it. Yeah. He came with it himself, and the players won't go with it. Yeah, you don't want to give him too much because then he keeps doing it. And you yeah. think, mm. and he thinks I quite like really that though. Funny. It's yeah. quite clever. Yeah, and he came up with it himself, did he? I don't know. I don't, I don't know. He don't know where he got. He'll, from. he'll probably say he did. He, he's like that's maybe one that's hit, but there's probably twenty new yeah, players that's right. come in and hasn't hit. So yeah, they've missed. What about for you, Connor? Tell us what Kenny's been like. Yeah, similarly to to Zach, he's a he's a bit of a father figure, and he's been um, enormous for me. Like I just be said before, with letting me play my natural game, and 
yeah, I guess I can get a little bit caught up in being in a spot at a certain time or um, being a bit rigid with routine during games. So it's been nice to have someone that um, releases all that expectation mm-hmm. and and when the first ball's bounce, I'm not really thinking about anything except for playing good football and, and being competitive. So it's been great for our whole young group and also our older guys. So um, now that we've got a young group, yeah, I think Kenny is just being that father figure can teach can teach these guys so much and he can be pretty stern sometimes, but I guess knowing that it comes from a good place, um, he wants the best for us. Can you give us a bit of an insight on what Travis Boak's like around the footy club? Because I think he almost seems too good to be true. He's a great looking bloke. He does wonderful (laughs) work for childhood cancer. He's an amazing footballer. He's just a bloody good human being. There's got to be some flaw in Bokey, and I've never been able to find it. Is he actually as perfect as we all think? Yeah, he's he's pretty close to it, um, Trav. I think maybe a girlfriend, marriage on the way. So talked about this many times. I said to him, "I'm helping find a girlfriend." Yeah, so I think <laughs> I think that's on the radar. I, I often bring it up to him probably the last year or two. So um, yeah. I've set him out a bit of a challenge. So. <laughs> Um, yeah. High standards. Are you imagine if you're a girl, right, <laughs> and you want to date Trav, you're never going to measure up to him. Yeah. And I know he spoke about he can't wait to be a dad one day in his life, and we were talking about that. I said, you know, now that you've said that, all these DMs are going to come sliding in. <laughs> yeah. and it was just relentless. Women and blokes probably <laughs> trying to yeah. get into him going, Trav, I want to be a part of it. But I actually I think he's such a remarkable person. The fact that you guys have been away with him, um, his influence around the club, Connor, what, what's he like? Yeah, although he's not our captain anymore, he sort of still has that figure around him and, and for the young guys that come in because he's have the, he has that body of work behind him and everyone knows him as the professional guy. Mm. Um, so many people look, look up to him and, yeah, prob- there's probably a little bit of pressure on him to, to keep doing that, And but I think he loves that, that side of the game, preparing himself and, and being ready for every week. So it's nice to have someone that has such high standards because, like I said before with Zach, mm. If you have one person that's really driving those standards, then everyone, everyone else sort of jumps along the jumps on the bus. So, yeah, for me personally, he's been uh, my mentor for the last couple of years. So, not only on the field has he been massive for my game and learning little mm. things in the midfield um, off of him, but also off field um, with him being so so vulnerable and and opening up over the last couple of years is yeah, he's been a massive mentor and role model for me. You know, that strength in vulnerability is pretty amazing. And I know you, Zach, if you're happy to talk about this, I know I think it was after the first season when you guys were all up at Marucci Door with Hugh Van Kylenberg, who I think is a, I've got a man crush on him. I think he's magnificent. <laughs> I know he's done a lot of work with you guys. But you shared your story. You would have been there, Connor, and you, you heard Zach talk about his sister and, you know, her ice addiction, and now she's through that. When you get someone at the club that opens up like that and shows <clears> that vulnerability, what did it do for the playing group? Yeah, it's it's hard to explain what it means when someone is able to be that vulnerable in front of such a big group of people. We spend every day together, but you you don't you just don't have those conversations mm. when you're in the locker room or before games or or any time really. So yeah, for us to have those moments where people are able to open up and we can learn about them more as a person, I think it it able it enables us to become closer as friends and, and as a brotherhood we're pretty much family we spend every single day together so I think our group has been really good especially at being being really open and um, we've had some people drive that at the football club over the last couple of years so I think it's a really important part of um, our culture as a whole now and hopefully the young boys can yeah really be a part of that. So that was three years ago, I think, Zach, wasn't it? So you yeah. fast forward, your time goes quick. How do you feel about that? Because I, I know that you were really nervous, and I, I think you said to Hugh Van Kylenberg, I just want to hurry up and bring the day forward because I actually really want to share this with the players. Yeah. It, it, it feels like, from what I've it changed your life in terms of how comfortable you became with yourself. Yeah, I remember we had the meeting at the club before we were going to the camp, and he said, um, I need 12 people, so just text me. And I pretty much texted him that night. And this was 12 people just to open up about Yeah, just to, to start the sort of, yeah, opening up stories and be a trend. And then I think after that, it was going to be randomly um, every mm. week, like do a few every week for the rest of the preseason. Yep. And I pretty much got home that night and texted him. And then I think once I texted him, then I already felt like a bit of pressure was off me because then mm. I'm like, oh, I've, and I, I sort of never had an opportunity in the past to actually just 
get it off my chest other than mum and dad and a few close mm. mates but then you sort of don't want to pour that onto mm. them so it was, I think it was just a good environment to an opportunity to open up and just talk about it and I think that yeah even outside footy clubs in the real world and workplace I think it's a good chance to actually just give people opportunities to actually do that and then I think you'll get a lot of out of that of more people opening up and sharing and then hopefully yeah more help as well comes along with that so I think I just needed the opportunity and yeah it probably been two or three years since the actual incident with my sister and yep. I'd just never spoken to anyone about mm. it and, yeah mum always would always ask if I was all right and fine and yep. to be fair I could, was pretty fine but I just never actually had a proper opportunity to open up to mates and um, sort of just let go of it and sort of move on as well. How did you feel once you, you had done that? And I remember Hugh saying the first day or two after you might feel regret or feel like it's bad or feel like everyone's sort of talking about it or whatever. And mm. I think the first day after it was a bit a bit weird because you didn't know how people were going to respond or take it. But I think ever since then it's been, it's been fine. And I think that, yeah, it's just been so good to move on and sort of not leave it behind but just, yep. yeah, sort of been open in the room and um, that, yeah, everyone knows and that it's not, a big issue really which I was probably playing out in my mind that it was bigger than it actually was and I think that's the main thing Yeah. whenever you share something you, you create all these pictures and um, stories in your own mind and when they're actually out there you're like like I've had so many people message me or come up and talk to me about their own family and their own issues and I think you, it makes you think like it's not at the end of the day it's not that big of a deal like it happens pretty commonly and there's others out there well, everyone has a story don't they and every yeah. family has a story and you never know what's happening you know next door I remember when I read you um talking about that story i think zach you know my my admiration i look at you and just go what a strong bloke to be able to reveal that um and i think it's great now that people are opening up and being vulnerable because it is it's a massive strength and it's a great character um trait i think to have and, and has that become now within the club something that you see people feel much more comfortable in their own skin do you reckon Connor? yeah 100 percent and like I said before, we've we've had a few people like you come into the club and drive that. So mm. now that pretty much all the older guys have shared their stories and and the younger guys as well, um, now we just have the new draftees come in and to learn their stories is is great. Like you said, there's everyone comes from a different background, a different story. Mm. Um, there's a lot that goes on behind closed doors that people often don't share, but because we spend so much time together, it's it's great to get to know people. And for them to open up, it takes a lot of burden off their shoulders, especially even for the guys that have only been there for a few months. They connect with the group a lot quicker, and I think that's happened for all the young guys that have come in. And Zach, can I ask, how is your sister? Yeah, she's good. She just had a baby. Oh, really? Um, right. So he's five months old now. So, yeah, right. she's good. She's living back home in country Victoria. So Brilliant. No, nah, it's good. Looking forward to getting over Christmas and, and seeing him. He's going pretty fast. So I get to see him probably every month by the time I get back home. So every time I get home, I'm like, Gee whiz, <laughs> babies grow fast. What a great story. So yeah. now she's in a really good place. Yeah, she's yeah she's in a really good place. And yeah, she's had a partner for a few years now yeah. and um, a baby. So mum and dad are enjoying that. And um, yeah, yeah, family's good. And your Uncle Zach? Yeah, Uncle Zach. So um, <laughs> yeah, she, it should be interesting. I don't know how I got babysitting news or anything, but um, happy to buy him the footies and, yeah. and, and all the gear. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. How good's that? Nah, yeah. And so the fact is your family now, after going through all that, must be just feel brilliant and tight and strong yeah yeah it's really good just yeah especially i think a baby always connects families and brings people together as well so yep. yeah he's starting to crawl around and get his teeth as well so it's been pretty funny and um yeah, yeah i've never had like a little brother or anything like that so yeah looking forward to winning kick the footy and um yeah probably when he starts being a little chirpy bugger to yeah, me so yeah. yeah it should be funny right i want you boys to take us inside the port adelaide football club Every club has a pest. <laughs> Who is the biggest one? Yeah, over the last year or two, it's definitely been Mitch Georgiatis. Like he's right. He's gone a new level as well, especially when he comes back from Perth and he's been around all his Perth mates. He comes yeah. back to Adelaide and has all these <laughs> new words. Himself. And there's a bit of coin floating around the family too, isn't there? Yeah. Over there in WA. Yeah, he gets back on the on his boats and on the Jeez. beach over to Rotto and. He did yeah. say boats, not boat. Yeah. <laughs> so there's a fair bit going on there. Yeah, a fair else. few boats and I think <laughs> jet skis and. Um, yeah, I went over there for a little holiday at the end of last year, and um, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty good set up in down yeah. in Cottesloe, and um, yeah, he reckons it's yeah the place to be. If you ask him, <laughs> <Jesus>. <laughs> so he's essentially the biggest problem in the club you got to deal with. Yeah, he's yeah. Good, he's good value, but yeah. um, I'm not sure how much time you can spend with Mitch before yeah. he gets on you. He's mate. pretty full on. Like you'll be sitting at home and. Sometimes he just rocks up to my house and just <laughs> knocks on the door, and, and I'm just relaxing. 
and then it just goes from zero to a hundred, right, in the space of two seconds, or yeah, or if you it's a day off and you you know just relaxing at home, you'll get a message and you already know what, it's like. What are you doing? <laughs> so he's like one of those sort of red cordial kids, just hundred miles an hour. He's the type of person that can never sit still. Yeah, he can't right. have a day off and sit and watch a movie. Yeah, like yeah. Relaxing, I don't think boring. he. I don't think he can watch movies at all because he can't. Yeah, sit he actually through. can't. He can't Is watch movies. Yeah. yeah, can't watch movies. Did you when you guys went over to um, LA? Did you fly with him? Oh, I didn't. Nah, nah. He came yeah. from Europe. I think he was with Emirates uh, Business. Of course, of course yeah. he did. <laughs> yeah, what was he in business? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Did he really? Yeah. Yeah. Me and Rose in economy. So. Yeah. <laughs> he was flying business. Yeah. Jesus. Well, there's you go knocking down, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds like he's a bloke that needs to be set up. Can we come up with some sort of way that uh, you can the set him up? The problem is, so you you do one thing and he'll take it and times it by yeah. twenty. So yeah. it's not even worth it. And you know he won't stop because he has no pause button. Like, <laughs> He has like no <laughs> off switch. Yeah, I mean, we're in America, and I'd just be like, "Is Rose up yet?" Yeah. Like, you should probably go wake him up. <laughs> he just run in Rose's room, open the door, start jumping on him, wrestling. Like, how old is he? Ten? <laughs> well, you think he could be? He could be. <laughs> you need those bikes around a footy club too, don't you? And just on him too, geez, he can take a hanger. Yeah, that is probably the biggest strength of his game. And at training, he's really hard to to put someone that is matched up well with him because obviously he's a fantastic runner um, but he right. can take mark of the year so yep. um, do you put a small on him do you put a tall on him so yeah I think he'll be a great asset for us going forward because he's so, such a hard person to get a good match up for. Zach I want to ask you about the number nine so you've got Robbie Gray's number obviously you've got a special relationship with Robbie too over the years particularly in those early days I know when you, you open up to Ken and Robbie about your, your family situation how did that number come about? Yeah, he just uh, gave me a call in the off-season. I was just back home um, in Backsmarsh. And, yeah, he just said that, yeah, he'd like me to wear it in the future and that it was up to me if I wanted to change from the 18. You know, I'd played a fair few games mm. over the last four years and that. And, yeah, he said there's no pressure, but he said, like, yeah, if anyone was going to wear it, he'd, he'd love me to be in it. So, yeah, he said take a few days to think about it, but it was, it was a pretty easy decision in the end. And, yeah, basically just said, yeah, I'd love to wear it. And, um, yeah, he just said he'd love to watch me in the many years to come. Hopefully, yeah play in it and hopefully win some flags in it and um, play in some big games with it. So, And it's good just to still have that connection with him as well, even though we aren't playing together and I'm not seeing him every day. That sort of mm. always keep us connected in the future, so looking forward to that. Well, everyone knows how good he was, but I think the best part of him was he's almost the perfect example of just letting your football do the talking because he's a pretty quiet guy. Was he always quiet around the boys? Yeah, yep. Um, he did did open up a little bit once you got to know him, but um, he was never the sort of person that was going to be like Mitch carrying on around yeah. the football club. And yeah, it's a good point because he quite literally let his football do the talking. He hated media, hated anything to do with um, having to talk. So yeah, just a great role model again to have around the football club. He was the type of person in meetings that if he did say, say something, everyone would listen because mm. he'd, he'd have something good to say. He needs to be involved in football down the track continuously, doesn't he? I know he will be at the moment, but yeah. He's got too much to offer to be lost to the game, doesn't he? Yeah, he's very good. And I think just along with all the on-field performances and accolades, like he was just a good teammate, so reliable, good family man, like just as good off-field mm. as he was on-field. You boys have played in two prelim finals in your first three years and you got really close with one and then the other one against the doggies we won't even talk about, right? But what's the mindset like around the club at the moment, Zach, now that you're getting back into it? Yeah, it's definitely a lot of motivation amongst the group and – um, you got guys at the top like Ollie and TJ and Boki um, that yeah really want it and have been at the club for a while. So and then you got yeah me, Connor, mm -hmm. Zave, um, Mitch, like sort of that younger uh, crew, just really trying to drive it and trying to push them as well and um, trying to yeah drive the stands and try and get back to them prelims and give ourselves another chance. So I think that's what's definitely motivating me at the moment and. Um, with a few recruits as well, with Jason and uh, Junior Riolu, who the Junior's looking unreal on the track at the moment, and even Orazio back, he's he's been training so far mm. uh, really well this um, preseason. So to have a few guys like them back, and even Big Scotty Lysette. So yeah, really looking forward to the season and um, just seeing what they can bring back to the team, and just looking back forward to getting back there and myself back in that um, yeah the big games. And what about for you, Connor? Obviously, you get that close. Does it just make you that much hungrier? And then how do you get yourself back into that uh, contention again? Yeah, pr people probably 
underestimate how much it takes out of you going deep in finals every mm. year. So it's a credit to the teams that do it every single year, not only physically with the extra games, but mentally getting so close and not getting there can be quite demotivating. So I guess we, we struggled last year, but this preseason feels like really fresh with the guys that have come in and obviously a few back from injury. So yeah, I feel like we do have that fire in the belly back again. Last year isn't where we wanted to finish, mm. but not making finals is probably giving us a fresh mental break to really attack this season. Is the window genuinely open? I feel like even just comparing our, our list to a couple of years ago, like I feel like we've, we're have we in such a good spot. We've got people that are in their prime and our, our young players are also getting better. We haven't lost a heap over the last couple of years. Obviously, Robbie's a, a big loss, but um, I feel like our young players have really taken a big step forward. So. And it's a hard question to ask, mm. us answer this time of year, but I feel like we've put ourselves in a good position list-wise and, and everyone's come back fit and excited, ready to go. So we're in a good position in that front. You've both had four years now at this top level. Zach, what's the best part of being an AFL footballer? It's lived up to everything I dreamt of as a kid, but probably just that that half an hour after a game where you've just achieved something with a lot of your mates. I think if you ask most people, that's – you sort of just not really thinking about too much other than mm. just that feeling and that adrenaline rush that you get post a win and the crowd's going crazy when you're walking off and then just going back in the change rooms, put music on and just there's no worries in the world for that half an hour. Yep. And I think that's probably just, yeah, the best feeling. What about for you, Connor? Coming into work and having 45 of your best mates who are all striving towards a similar goal essentially. So, yeah, it's pretty cool compared to most jobs where people probably dread coming into work and mm. sitting at a desk or being around people that they don't like that much. It's really nice to have people who are similar minded and also striving towards the same thing. Team sports are great for that. What's the biggest thing that you've got to deal with as, a, as an AFL player? The sacrifices, like not seeing family and friends and missing events and stuff. But, but in the end, like it's all worth it for that, to win games mm. of footy and get that feeling post footy. So I think you take the good with the bad and the bad with the good. So I think probably just to sacrifice me moving away from home and that, but created my own network over here now and got really good friends and I'm um, in a really good team and yeah, part of something cool. So I think that, yeah, as long as you make them sacrifices, that you get a lot of good in return as well. It's, you're not hiding the nothing answering that question, aren't you? Because anyone listening or reading any of this will sit there and go, you're privileged, you blokes, you're getting played good coin, you're getting to do that. So there's actually nothing to complain about, but you're professional athletes. Spotlight's on you every time. So there's got to be massive challenges. Connor, I'll ask you, do you read the paper? Do you look at social media or do you just block yourself from all of that? Early days used to be a reader of most things and that's probably because most of it was positive coming in. Mm. Our first year was, was, like you said before, pretty decent in terms of our form and, and we were winning a fair few games. So, yeah, I used to read it but then – I guess you go through a patch where you're not playing so well and all of a sudden everyone jumps off the bandwagon and you're the worst football player in the state and um, everyone hates you. So I think that's probably the most frustrating part for me is I, I've learned over the first couple of years to deal with that and, and I don't read it anymore. My social media is just my family and friends. So you essentially won't read, don't even bother reading it? No. Do you read the paper? It, no, or, I don't. No, it's, it's, a, it's hard to avoid, obviously, your friends and family are reading it, so yeah. they're sending you things um, that are in it, but... Yeah, I don't read the paper at all and it does frustrate me when, you know, you get sent something from um, family or friends about one of your teammates who someone from the outside has got a comment on what they think should happen to them or who they think they are as a person or a player, which is totally inaccurate, but mm -hmm. because they have got an opinion and um, a platform to to share that opinion, people are reading it and, and taking mm -hmm. that on board. So. I guess I've learned to deal with that, but it still frustrates me when I see that with my teammates and friends. Do you read much, Zach, or get involved in any of that? No, nah, not too much. I'm not massive on like media as well. I think I think you definitely learn over the journey like who to um, listen to and who's the best for you and like who actually cares about mm. you, not mm. just as a player, like they care about all the other things in your life as well. And I think, yeah, you definitely meet them people and um, acknowledge them people that do actually yeah definitely not judgmental and um, do all that stuff so they're yeah and you learn that they're your coaches your teammates your family your friends so I think you, you learn definitely what mm -hmm. people to listen to it'd be like you as well like mm -hmm. people have opinions on you and mm -hmm. you know your kids your family yeah. um, your best mates they're the ones that actually really matter 
once someone said to me, you've probably heard it before, but they said, what people think about you is none of your business. Which I think yeah, is a bloody, it's, it's a yeah. simple saying. It's a yeah. bloody good mm-hmm. saying, isn't it? Because everyone's going to have opinions, and particularly because you blokes are out there. Take the good with the bad. There's mm-hmm. a lot of people that have absolutely no idea what they're talking about, and you've probably just got to shift that to the side and listen to the people who matter. Yeah. Most of them are inside the football club or your family and friends. And um, yeah, it's a hard industry to be in because it's so performance based mm. um, week to week. There's not a lot of jobs where you come in and people judge you on how you perform your job so critically mm. and, and in the limelight. You talked about your support structure and that. Who do you kind of surround yourself with? Who do you listen to? Obviously outside of family, but do you have particular people that, uh, that guide you through? My family is probably my main one and also my partner. I've pretty much told them that when I come home, I hate talking about footy. So right. it's nice and refreshing to come home and talk about what other people are doing or you know the house that I'm doing at the moment or what I'm studying. Um, it's quite refreshing because I've never been a footy head. I didn't grow up watching heaps of games on the weekend and that sort of thing. Uh, I love my other sports. I love cricket and soccer. Yeah. I wouldn't watch any games on the weekend of football. So, Do you yeah. watch any other games at all? No, I try not to, yeah. Unless it's a big game and there's 10 minutes yeah. left and um, someone else is watching it, then I might sit down and, and have a look. But um, I'd much rather flick on some EPL or, or NBA. Yeah. So you, feel you need that space, that separation? Hundred percent. It's yeah. it's so mentally draining coming into the club, and some people love it. Um, they can go into the club and, and watch vision about how they're playing all day, and go home and watch other people play. But um, I like having that separation between going to work and being fully invested in that, and then coming home and being able to completely switch off and do something different. Yep. Are you a footy head? Yeah, so I'm a little bit. Different. You are, aren't you? Yeah. 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 Growing up as well, I like. Yeah, I used to watch like the, the seven games a weekend pretty much. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then, yeah, not as much now, but I probably still watch three or four a weekend. And yeah, it's, I think it's nice just watching other people. I, I don't really watch it for the support or mm. I just admire good players and like watching good players and sort mm. of seeing what they do as well. So I, th- I think I'm probably more watch it now from an education point of thing and yeah. um, just enjoyment of seeing good players do good things. I'm not one to sit there and sort of, yeah, get in the teams yeah. or get in the players. I just like sitting there and, watching players do good things and yeah trying to take that into my own game or but yeah I still enjoy footy and I still love probably the most the best footy I like watching is just going back home watching local footy watching my mates play and um, when I get the chance to do that I always try and jump on it so but like Connor said yeah my I think mum and dad and yeah my partner as well have just been really good they're, they're always they know that you probably talk to most people about footy so when you when you're with them it's it's pretty much um, no like there's not too much footy spoken yeah. about and this is lots of laughs and yeah, just bringing up good times. Now, you boys are on the eve of going off to your footy camp. So by the time this comes out, you'll be smack bang on the camp. You get nervous going on a footy camp because you know you're going to get absolutely whipped, <laughs> don't you? Yeah, a little bit nervous. What's in store? Because it's a week, essentially. <laughs> yeah, this is and actually- where off to this one? We're going to Maroochador, so- oh, Well, that's nice where, obviously, hot. you guys were three years yeah, ago, which exactly. is a really important yeah. spot for you, no yeah. doubt. Yeah. What's in store? This is actually the first time that they've sent us our schedule beforehand. Yeah. A lot of training yeah. is probably the main thing that we're doing up there, but there's some team bonding um, right. exercises, paintball. I think we're doing yeah. one, of that, oh, one good. of the days. It's always good uh, fun. Just shoot, oh, we'll watch shoot your mates. <laughs> you want to be on George Yardy's team, don't you? Because he's clearly going to run a muck and probably just yeah. pop all his teammates as well as the opposition. Probably not, actually, because he'd walk up behind you and shoot yeah. you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, footy clubs and paintball just don't mix. Like, yes. Yeah. You end up like your own teammates are shooting you in the back. Yeah. It's just people get too carried away and just, yeah, there's, there's too much fun yeah. involved. Three years ago when you at Maruchi, obviously you, you had those sessions where, you know, you revealed your, your family story. Is that something that's still part of the footy club? Yeah, there'll be some sort of session like that, I'm sure, while we're up there, probably a couple yeah. more so for the boys that haven't been at our football club mm. before for everyone to hear their story and where they've come from and how they've grown up. So, yeah, I'm sure there's something like that in store. Yeah, I, I think I've adapted to camps as well and, like, being in your fourth, going to our fifth season now, I think – Ollie Wines actually said something that I've just remembered to this day. We're doing a running session one day, and I'm like, "Oh, they don't." I said to him, "They don't really get easier, do they?" And he just said, "No, they they do get easier because I'm ten years in now, and nothing's broken me. I've got through every session, and I've had a good career, and yeah. um, won a lot of games, and been pretty dribble player. So I think that's always stuck with me. That yeah, it's hard, but like yeah. you look back and like kind of spoke about before your base and all the work you've done, like that like you haven't broken." 
any time yet. And yeah. So you're just in them hard moments. That's all I really think of now. I get the impression, seeing what you're like, Zach, that you'd actually embrace these camps, wouldn't you? Because you just have to go 100 miles an hour and that feels like it would suit your personality. Yeah, it's a, I, I enjoy it. I think the competitive nature mm -hmm. as well. It's a good test to see um, and challenge yourself as well. That Yeah, it's always pretty hard when you have training and then you have lunch and then they give you another running session in the afternoon. And I think they're always the hardest ones. And that's where you always find the people that can dig deep and yeah. go that extra bit. And I think, yeah, and you look at the best players in our club, they can all do that. Bokey, Ollie, yeah. TJ, Darcy Byrne jones like them leaders and people that have been around a long time in their moments stand up. So, and I think that correlates on field performances as well. Zach, it'd be remiss of me not to touch on your golf. I did have the pleasure of seeing you smack some golf balls at Grange one day. Uh, how are you going with it? Yeah, it's good. We're members at Westlake, so yeah, yes. shout out to Westlakes. <laughs> the handicap's just under 17 at the moment, so right. making good progress, but yeah, I, I'd love you to- You hit it hard. Yeah, I, I try to, for a little smack fella. It. Yeah, I try to put a bit of power in it. Um, <laughs> it actually does hit a big ball. Yeah. But yeah, I'd love to get to where Rose is at the moment. He's what are you playing off? No, I'm not that great. I'm 12 or 13. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah. Bloody hell. Are you at West Lakes as well? Yeah, I'm at West Lakes, yeah. What's the strength of his games, eh? <laughs> yeah, he, he hits, he's pretty. He's probably more powerful than me. He hits a bigger yeah. ball than me, so. It's not straight. But, yeah, he's got a nice short game. Right. Do you know, Connie, you look to me like one of those blokes at school and that that really annoyed you because you would have been good at everything. Because you watch when you play football. You know when you watch someone play and you just see balance, smooth, all these sorts of things. Were you a good cricketer, good tennis player? You're sort of good at everything you take on? Yeah, cricket was probably my main sport growing up, actually. Right. Till 15-ish. So yep. um, we actually moved down from the country so that I could play cricket and my sister for school. So interestingly, I didn't probably change to football as my main sport until under 16s, I think. What was the strength? I was a batter. Really? Yeah. Right. Imagine classy, just little Nick flicks yeah. down. Lo the actually, side. loves. He, we we had a little T Twenty comp the last few years, and loves a reverse sweep. I've heard about the T Twenty comp yeah. down at Grange, isn't it? Reverse sweep is just loves them early, early on in innings <laughs> as well. Actually, you know, you batted really well. Remember the the um, the bushfire relief game at yeah. the Adelaide yeah. Oval uh, a few years back. You actually batted really well. I remember that. Yeah, that was good fun. Actually, it's probably the most nervous I've ever been for <laughs> any sports event ever. Yeah. Running out. Rashid. It was 30, 40,000 people. It was good. There. It was a great yeah. crowd. It raised a million bucks. Yeah, it was, it was a amazing. massive crowd. day. Um, but yeah, you better. Well, Bokey batted all right too. Yeah, he was pretty good. You yeah. two put on a few runs, I reckon, that day, didn't you? Yeah, not bad. It's always cool when you can say you're really out by yeah. Him and Bokey car. are very similar, I feel, actually. Like, Bokey's good at cricket. I'd imagine being good at tennis, but their jump yeah. shots, basketball. No. <laughs> probably where <laughs> their downfall is. Is that it? Well, we, and we know Bokey can hit a decent ball too with his golf. Mm. He just pounds it. Yeah. Yep. So a little Bokey Junior here. Uh, I knew Connor you'd be one of those kids that would have been. Did, what did you get for year twelve score? Ninety eight point something. No, probably? I wasn't. I wasn't last for sure. I think Let's I was not bring it there. Yeah. Let's you not bring it. What did you get? <laughs> no, I was. <laughs> yeah, I was. I was mid twenties. Out of out of hundred. <laughs> <laughs> he did. That's he did. no word of a lie. Nah, that's, that's really yeah. Yeah, I remember telling mum throughout the year, like, I'm tracking well here, mum. And then <laughs> you go mid 20s, I'm thinking, I'm, I'm sure it's out of 100. Yeah. No, I remember, yeah, going through, like, I'm tracking well here, mum, like, putting the work and stuff. And then I right, we're actually on the bus for my, we were on our first camp, first year on the bus, and there's a few boys around. I'm like, I don't really want to open it around here, but I was pretty eager. I, I didn't think it was going to be that bad. <laughs> I thought maybe like 40 or 50, and then. 24, I remember messaging mum and she thought I was joking. I'm like, no, nah, I'm not joking. <laughs> exactly. So Little lucky respect. footy worked out. Yeah. Did you go to school often in year 12? Yeah, I, went to, not give a I went, went to school often. Um, I had a shoulder reco, so I sort of used that. It's as a, an excuse? Yeah, it's an excuse to not go for a little for like two or three weeks. And in that two or three weeks, I just didn't study at all. Didn't do any of the work they'd sent me. And then I, when I come back from that, dropped a subject and then just started going to the gym in that subject instead of studying. The, the gym didn't actually help me too much either. <laughs> See, but that's why you're smart because then you didn't waste your energy trying to make up on something that wasn't going to get anywhere. You're better putting your energy into becoming yeah, a footballer. No, I'm happy to roll with that. <laughs> so I always call that intelligence. And the one thing too, I will add that given what you've talked about with your family over the past few years, your emotional intelligence is probably a 98 out of 100. <laughs> so I reckon you can take that and who gives a shit about the academic stuff? Because it's not going to help you kick the footy, is it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not now, but probably post footy. So, yeah, trying to work on that and put a bit of um, time into that in the next few years. So we'll worry about that later on. <laughs> and for any kids that are listening, look, it is important that you get a good score in. <laughs> I recommend it. Definitely recommend. Twenty is yeah. not ideal, no. but 
if you do get a 20 and you work on other stuff, you can still be a massive success like you, Zach, maybe. Yeah, hopefully. Is that but, yeah, def- that? Definitely recommended um, put time into study and education. <laughs> but also have the other buckets full too, yeah. just in case you need them. Yeah, just a good balance, all around good balance. Absolutely. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. I love watching both of you play, and uh, I can't wait to uh, to see you guys finally crack that flag in the next couple of years while the window is still open. Yes. Thanks for having me, Sotis. Appreciate it. Thanks, Pleasure. Absolute pleasure, boys. Good on you. Well, guys, thanks so much for listening. Now, if you love what you just heard, please subscribe to the Soda Room podcast. You could write a review. Uh, You can watch the show on YouTube and share it with your buddies. And if you'd like to get in touch with the show, drop us a line, info at thesodaroom.com. Catch you soon. Soda Room.